Thomas T. So these two chapters, we're, we're heading into the finale now of the Vidyeshwar Sanghita. And this Sanghita covers all the means of worshiping Shiva. Some of the philosophical truths, or actually most of the philosophical truths, the deep explanations of Shiva's nature and so on, will be in the Rudra Sanghita, which is coming next. But this Sanghita deals with the practical means. How do we worship Shiva? How do we get the benefits? What are the practices? What are the customs? What are the values that a devotee of Shiva should have or should pursue, anyway, in his devotional service so that he's successful, so that he actually realizes Shiva? Now, what it means to realize Shiva, that's something that we went over in the little mini-series on the Mandukya Upanishad. And we're going to continue to go into that Upanishad because it explains the deep nature of Shiva and the realization of Shiva, according to the Upanishads. Now, something that I want to mention, in fact, emphasize, is that these practices are not at all sectarian. Although, yes, we do encourage people to take initiation in the Shaiva cult, uh, which isn't really much of a cult. You know, it's not a secret. You go everywhere in India, especially in South India, and there are Shiva Lingams everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. You go out in a field in the middle of nowhere, and there'll be a little temple, a little shrine with Shiva Lingams made from rocks. I mean, you, you can't go anywhere in India without bumping into Shiva. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not exactly a secret cult, but it is a lifestyle, it is a point of view, and it is definitely a set of practices. And the basic practices, the most common fundamental practices, are emphasized in these final chapters of the Vidyeshwara Sanghita, namely, wearing Tripundraka, taking Shiva's Naivedya, or prasadam, as it's often called, and chanting the holy names of Shiva. And this last is especially important. You know, these beads aren't just for decoration. <laughs> They're for use, for counting the mantras. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. So, in this way, we have an idea how much we're chanting. It's a good idea to regulate your chanting, to do the same amount every day. And the Shiva Purana recommends a thousand in the morning and a thousand in the evening. That's 10 rounds on the beads. That takes about 40 minutes. Each thousand names takes about 40 minutes. It's not a whole lot of time. We used to do something similar in the Vaishnava temples where we would chant the Krishna mantra. Uh, that's 16 rounds, but since the mantra is longer, it took about the same amount of time, about an hour and a half. So if you can't devote an hour and a half of your life to God, well, what's the meaning of your spiritual aspirations. Why are you even watching these videos? <laughs> you know, uh, you have to be willing to walk the walk as well as talk the talk and, and watch the videos. <laughs> the videos are only really to enthuse you, to give you the perception that, hey, this is possible. In fact, this is really the preferred way to live for any human being. Why? Because, as he says in chapter 22 here, this chanting the name of Shiva cools the forest fire of material existence. Huh? 
Sangsara dava nala lida loka, tranaya karunya ganaganatva. That the blazing fire of material existence is cooled, extinguished by the nectarian downpour of the holy names. So this is the mercy, see, this is the benediction that the devotees, the realized devotees, are giving to the rest of the world. This is the teaching that is meant to benefit the entire human race and even the animals and plants. So it's not at all sectarian. It's not at all restricted to a certain group of people, either by race or by birth or nationality or culture or even the time when they're born, in the past or the present or the future. It is a universal message, and it is of universal goodwill, that if you at all want the spiritual benefits that come from the salvation or liberation from material suffering, please chant this holy name of Shiva. It will make you happy and it will make those around you happy. Offer food to Shiva and take the remnants. And certainly wear the sacred ashes, at least on your forehead, if not in 32 places on your body like I do. That's also recommended, and it will be discussed in the latter chapters, I think 24 uh, and 25. So these practices are very simple. Anybody can get ashes. Anybody can get a mala, a necklace of beads. Or if you don't have a mala, you can count on your fingers. Huh? Count on the joints of your fingers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Nine times twelve is 108. That's one mala. So you can count the names or the mantras on your fingers and it's just as good as beads, huh? if not better. So there is nothing stopping anyone from benefiting from this teaching. It's non-sectarian, it's universal, it's easy, it's simple. Huh? Aung Namah Shivaya, anyone can chant it. So simple, so easy, and yet the benefits are so powerful and so immediate. If you try it, simply chanting this name, this mantra, you will experience it for yourself. So try it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Do the experiment. Don't simply languish in the uh, burning ocean of material existence. This is not our real life. This is not what we're meant for. This is not our potential. Uh, the potential of a human being is really unlimited. Don't remain stuck in this paltry material life and suffering so many indignities and embarrassments every day. But fix yourself up in the consciousness of a devotee and worship Lord Shiva and in the next section, the Rudra Sanghita, you're going to hear all kinds of anecdotes and stories and historical incidents concerning Shiva. But still, keep in mind what realization of Shiva really is. Shiva is identified with the Sushupti stage of consciousness, deep sleep. And... There's no way I can describe what it means to change your point of view from thinking that waking consciousness is the center of life to realizing that what we normally think of as deep sleep and a complete ignorance <laughs> is actually the center of life. Why is that? because Sushupti is also identified with the Ananda Maya stage. The Ananda Maya is bliss. Why does everyone love to sleep? 
why does everyone need to sleep? I mean, to the extent that in sleep deprivation experiments, people kind of go nuts after about eight or nine days of no sleep, no deep sleep. Because deep sleep is bliss. One time, Sariputta, one of the Buddhas, or maybe the uh, highest disciple of the Buddha, was giving a talk about Nibbana, Nirvana. And he was saying, in Nirvana, nothing is felt and is so blissful. And so the other monks were going, well, wait a minute. How can it be blissful if nothing is felt? And Sariputta replied, oh, that's exactly it. Nothing is felt. That's what's so blissful about it. Because every experience, every perception, every sensation, every uh, impression of this material world is painful. Think about it for a minute. This world is imperfect, it's temporary, it's not at all pleasing, and there's no permanent happiness here. So every time we have an experience in the material world, it reminds us this place is not really what we want. This is not going to make us happy. So we want happiness. We want eternal existence, no death. And we want to be all cognizant. We want to know everything. We want to be aware of everything. This is not possible in material consciousness, in dualistic consciousness. Jagrat, simply not possible. So where is it possible? And of course, the answer is in Shushupti. Shushupti is the seed from which the whole world manifests in consciousness. Now, isn't that what we want? Don't we want this seed that contains all knowledge, all bliss, all the different manifestations of the things that make us happy? and yet in which there is no birth, no death, no time, no change. See, this is Shiva, Shiva consciousness. So when the Shastra says that one who practices this, that, and the other thing becomes Shiva, what it means is that the center of gravity of one's consciousness shifts from Jagrat to Svapna, to Sushupti. This is a very deep thing, and I, I can't express how satisfying it is. It's like all the little things that used to bug me about material life and other people and even myself don't bug me anymore. It's like I'm immune to it. Why is that? I have a source of deep, satisfying pleasure that doesn't go away. That's Shiva. That's Sushupti. That's when the center of gravity of our existence comes into the realm of what we usually call deep sleep. But when we go into that realm with awareness, it's not ignorance anymore. It's bliss, ananda moya. So the uh, next two chapters will be the conclusion of the Vidyeshwara Sanghita. And uh, then we'll give a summary of the entire Sanghita. And then we'll move on to the Rudra Sanghita. But maybe in between, we'll do a few more videos on the Upanishads because that's really the origin of this teaching. And the Puranas 
are the expression of the mercy of the great souls who put these truths into stories so that anyone can understand, even a child. And this will inculcate these deep truths into one's consciousness painlessly. <laughs> and uh, by this means, you'll come to understand everything without having to do uh, arduous study or tapasya. So this is the great mercy of Shiva Purana. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you continue to stay with us as we go into the Rudra Sanghita. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.